Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dinda Elliott, the Executive Director of the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies and a longtime foreign correspondent. I covered China, Southeast Asia, and Russia. But I'm here this evening because I'm the daughter of Oz Elliott, for whom the Osborne Elliott Prize for Excellence in Journalism on Asia Prize was named. Oz was a legendary journalist. He was editor of Newsweek magazine during its heyday, a champion of civil, civic journalism during the civil rights era, the women's liberation movement, and the Watergate hearings. And he believed deeply that journalism is a higher calling. Uh, Oz was also passionate about the Asia Society where he was a trustee. And so Richard Holbrook, the American statesman and a family friend who was then chairman of Asia Society, decided together with Nick Platt, then president of the Asia Society, to create a prize in Oz's name for excellence in journalism in Asia. The winners of the prize over almost two decades are really truly a who's who of some of the greatest journalists of our time, and no less so this year. The jury is delighted this year to present the award to two remarkable journalists, a reporter and a photographer who covered the final days before the fall of Kabul. As the Taliban closed in, Mathieu Aikens and Jim Hulebrook, dogged freelancers with deep knowledge of Afghanistan, bravely rode their bicycles around Kabul, talking with high-level government officials, intellectuals, and other sources they'd cultivated for many years. In this penetrating New York Times Magazine piece with rich human stories, Aikens and Hoylebrook documented the destruction of a liberal vision of Afghanistan, a vision that may never have reached beyond the compounds and cafes of Kabul, and the tremendous poignant loss for so many once hopeful Afghans. The piece reflects years spent learning the culture, the country, and the people of Afghanistan. And so on behalf of the Elliott family and the Asia Society, we are so delighted to be honoring Mathieu and Jim with this prize. And now I'd like to turn this program over to my great friend, Marcus Browkley, former editor of the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and the founder of North Base Media. So over to you, Marcus. Thank you, Dinda. Uh, good evening, everyone, or morning, depending on where in the world you are. I'm delighted to join all of you in the Asia Society and welcoming everyone to this event. I'm especially pleased to welcome um, Mathieu and Jim, whom we'll join in a conversation in a minute. But first, I wanted to add a bit about the prize. As, as Dinda has said, the Oz Prize is named after one of the truly great figures in American journalism, her father, Osborne Elliott, who was you know, a charismatic leader of one of America's greatest magazines in its era, um, back when Newsweek magazine had its name gracing the pinnacle of a tower on Madison Avenue. He'd assembled some of the finest writers, correspondents, and photographers in the business. They brought intelligence, courage, and imagination to their work. And it's no surprise then that when Oz's friends decided to create this prize, they would also want to celebrate those traits in journalism. Unusually for journalism prizes awarded here in the U.S., this one draws entries from news outfits not only in the U.S., but also from global media companies and from journalists in the region itself. Over the years I've served on this jury, it's been noticeable how many more high-quality entries we receive each year from journalists from Asia, not merely covering Asia. The entries we get paint a picture each year of the major events and themes across the region. For several years, we've had strong entries depicting the consequences of China's coercive treatment of minorities in Xinjiang and other regions. This year, we had a powerful entry on the sweeping political and economic policy changes afoot under President Xi Jinping, who I think may be the purest ideologue to lead modern China. There was some incredible reporting from Myanmar's harsh crackdown on protesters demanding a restoration of democracy there. From India, we had a project on how Prime Minister Modi's government uses technology to surveil domestic opponents and journalists. Amid rising talk of an economic decoupling between the US and China, we got strong entries from journalists who tackled the lively matters of semiconductor supply chains and the uneven application of economic sanctions, topics that, I sa I, that when I say they may sound dry, but trust me, are vitally important to understand the details. We have every year a great jury uh, deciding this prize. This year's jury includes uh, Barbara Demick, who's a journalist, author, and 2006 Osborne, prize, Osborne Elliott Prize winner. 
obviously Dinda, um, Nisid Hajari, um, who's an author and member of the Bloomberg Editorial Board, Zoraida Ibrahim, Executive Managing Editor of the South China Morning Post, and Norm Perlstein, a media, longtime media executive advisor and former top editor of the Los Angeles Times, Time Inc., and the Wall Street Journal. So we're fortunate to have uh, Matthew and, and Jim with us tonight to talk about the extraordinary package they published in the New York Times Magazine last December on the fall of Kabul, and more about their experiences covering Afghanistan. They both lived in, in Kabul for years. Um, they've learned languages, traveled widely, getting to know the culture of the people in the place. Matthew has written a book, which is I have not read, but I just acquired, uh, called The Naked Don't Fear the Water, which has received rave reviews for its uh, tracing of a journey to Europe with Afghan refugees. Jim has published a book of photographs from Afghanistan in 2018. Um, so thank you both for being with us here. I'm going to lead you in a conversation, and then we'll open it up to uh, floor question. Open up to the floor for questions. Uh, the floor, the virtual floor. Um, after about uh, 40 minutes. So let me just start rather prosaically and ask each of you uh, to tell us a little bit about how you came to Afghanistan in the first place. First of all, thank you um, for having us. And, and uh, it's a tremendous honor, which we could be doing this in person, but times being that they are, uh, we are doing it virtually. So I came to Afghanistan in 2008. It was uh, a trip that I had started in Europe when I graduated. I graduated college and kind of wanted to see the world, travel, try to be a writer. And I started in Europe, was sort of hitchhiking and couch surfing, and made my way to Central Asia with the ultimate intention of reaching India. And it would turn out to be a lot, be a lot easier to get an Afghan visa. Um, then a Turkmen visa in Tashkent in Uzbekistan. So um, in the fall of 2008, I crossed the Amu Darya to Mazar-i Sharif in northern Afghanistan, started traveling the country, realized by a stroke of uh, genetic luck, um, I looked Afghan, I passed for Afghan. I'm, I'm half Japanese, half European origin, but um, I was able to travel a little more adventurously in the country as a result. And I, I just got kind of pulled in um, the country is obviously a place that has a strong attraction for an almost romantic one for a lot of visitors. And perhaps that's what it was in the beginning. But, uh, you know, after a while, when you learn the language and you start to put down roots, then it um, becomes this also the story of your friends that you're covering. So that's, that's in essence how I got started. Um, for me, I um, was in college in photo school uh, in 2014 um, with the intention of, of covering uh, foreign assignments and uh, or, or pipeline dream of covering foreign assignments uh, related to conflict and um, like political importance. And I was about to graduate and I was looking at what I was going to um, do, where I was going to go. And at the time, um, Syria and Iraq were um, in the news uh, because of uh, ISIS uh, advancing and taking large swathes of, of uh, the countries there. And I thought that might be a bit uh, pushing it um, for risk, but also in terms of like, there was a, a, a lot of journalists that were there. While in Afghanistan, um, th there was still the conflict and there was still the U.S. and international community uh, heavily involved, um, but it was sort of uh, pushed a bit to uh, the background. Um, so I thought if I would go there, I could uh, try and find a foothold and um, and shoot a portfolio and see where I uh, end up. So I booked a ticket and um, and went with my backpack for um, what I intended to be a couple of months. Um, and then it ended up being uh, many years so far. Um, so yeah, that's how I uh, how I got started. Maybe I'll, I'll just add to that, Marcus. You know, it's funny because I I met. Jim in 2016, uh, not long after he had, he had arrived. And obviously our stories are a little bit similar. And I remember thinking at the time, I'm a bit older and I remember thinking at the time, um, here's this young freelancer who's, who was staying with an Afghan friend and who's learning the language and at the start of this adventure. And I just thinking that that kind of reminded me of myself and wondering where this adventure was going to take him. I was on my way out of the country at the time 
um, I was doing this book and then I, I didn't come back for a number of years. Um, but I, but it's funny cause then I did, when I did come back last summer, then uh, fate sort of brought us together. So I, I'm guessing a lot of people, even a lot of journalists might not, you know, choose to sort of meander across the border in Afghanistan because it was easier to get a visa than it was to somewhere else or, you know, decide to get on an airplane and just drop into a place that I think a lot of people perceive to just be a giant war zone. Um, you did that. But then you also did something else, which I think is unusual among journalists. You both kind of immersed yourself selves in the culture. And I think you both studied language. You both you, you lived outside of the of the compounds, I guess, and outside of the sort of the military, um, the military sphere. Is that right? Uh, that's right. Yeah. I mean, journalists in general don't really beyond embeds, uh, don't really live in the, in the military sphere. Um, but it's one thing going to Afghanistan on assignment with a newspaper and another, uh, going there on at your own expense and uh, having to rely on on yourself and the network that you sort of um, gather. Um, but then, yeah, for me personally, um, I've traveled around the world, um, always trying to sort of immerse and um, make sure that I I'm like culturally appropriate. And usually, the way that works is you try and learn the language. Um, so you can communicate um, directly. And I, I thought me going to Afghanistan on my own, uh, that would be important that I spend time with um, with uh, the people there rather than um, solely in the expat community as sometimes happens. Um, and that eventually helped uh, hugely um, in terms of being able to um, to do work and, and to get around the country. I think that when you, when you're a freelancer and you can't rely on the support of um, an institution or you're often paying your own expenses, then it really helps to have built the kind of infrastructure for yourself uh, to have learned the language. So you don't have to be constantly hiring translators to have a network of contacts, but also just a physical place to say, to put down roots in a place, um, and that's, that's what I did. And then I left. And when I came back last summer, again, I ended up staying, moving in with uh, Jim, who had a room in Kabul and for, in his house in Kabul. And um, he had built this whole you know, network of he had, he had people he was working with and a, a motorcycle, and, et cetera. And uh, that, that's really essential to, I think, being able to spend the kind of time immersing yourself in deep projects. And it also became the, um, the infrastructure that we built on to, to, um, to kind of get through the dramatic events of last summer and the collapse. Well, one of the things that really distinguished your, your package was how you went high and low. You described, for example, an incredible scene at the presidential palace where President Ghani was almost oblivious to the crisis, then suddenly gone. And the tale of a bureaucrat whose family had fled Kabul when she was a girl and then was forced many years later to flee, or flee again as much as her family had done. How did you sort of navigate that? So I understand, you know, from your, what you said before, just a minute ago about, you know, immersing yourself in the culture or learning language, you were able to, you know, anchor yourselves more in, in, um, in non-official Afghanistan, but how did you do it on the other side of it? How did you, how do you navigate into the echelons society where you could know what's going on in the presidential palace as well? well I, over, you know, the years I had gotten to know uh, a lot of people who then ascended into the, those, those ranks. So it was a very young administration and, and a lot of the people that were just, you know, kids my age at par parties in Kabul 10 years ago were now serving as senior aides or officials uh, in the government. So, so it was partially a function of that, but, um, the, you know, the, the, the structure, the, the skeleton of the story is about our the events that we witnessed or the other people witnessed, you know, the actual lived experience. But once that was in place, I, I spent a long time, um, trying to fill in the behind the high level narratives, not just what was happening in the palace, but was happening, for example, in Doha and meetings between U S officials and the Taliban. And that, that there was just a lot of, um, legwork that I did in DC and New York. The, the thing was that most of these the witnesses to this kind of high level stuff were actually outside of Afghanistan after they evacuated. 
Uh, so there was a whole kind of uh, period where once I got out and it was sort of, we had to wait a while to be able to just fly out normally again after the collapse. But once I got out, I, I, I tracked down one of those details and players. How did Matthew, since you were there for, for a longer period of time, how did, how did it, how did Kabul change over the years you were there from when did you get there? The first 2000? In 2008. 2008. You know, 2008, it, it changed a lot. It just, it, it grew. It, it, it was a boom town and um, suffered from a lot of problems of hyper, you know, uncontrolled urbanization, traffic, um, pollution, crime. But I think, for, you know, the, the part that I, that I really observed as a foreign journalist, as an expat was how, um, a, a whole cadre of young uh, cohort of young Afghans had kind of emerged who were more liberal, westernized. Maybe it's some of them had studied abroad, but they were, they were people who had been born or grown up in Afghanistan. And they, you know, instead of going to a party or some kind of event and just seeing other foreigners there, you saw a lot of um, Afghans who were now your peers. And so there was this kind of nascent um, uh, Afghan uh, element to, to that, that bubble world. Did it feel to you that the, um, you know, obviously the, the package for which you won this award was about the collapse, the rapid collapse of, of the government and the, the whole structure that had been put into place. Did it feel to you at any point or did the people who were living in that time f- expect that this was as vulnerable as it proved to be? And I don't, I don't think there were many people who expected the collapse to come as quickly. I did, to be honest, I did meet a couple uh, in that, in that period, you know, in the last final months who were warning that the end was, was nigh, but um, no, I think everyone to varying degrees suffered from a kind of collective uh, delusion that was um, partly the product of propaganda and lies that were pumped out by our our military, um, and which the Afghan government, you know, learned from. There were there were psyops departments that were funded by uh, the foreign military at all the major Afghan security services. And as we know now, the, the U.S. military was um, lying and manipulating um, statistics about the capabilities of Afghan forces. So there was a collective delusion, but there was also, I think, a propaganda machine that fed it. Hmm. Jim, did you perceive did, what? How did you think about the stability of Afghanistan, the society there? And um, you obviously were traveling around the country doing your own journalism. You know, how did you perceive it? Did you see it as as inevitable that the that this would ultimately not succeed the the U.S. experiment in Afghanistan? Um, I think yeah that um a lot of it was built on on lies and deceit um but i do think that there was actually in the last couple of years sort of a more liberal um urban um society was taking taking uh footholds um and i do think that that was real that um people were actually starting to um, like express themselves um, and, edu- and be more educated um, in the way that we may think about that. But then the countryside and also large parts of cities uh, always remained very conservative and very traditional. And I think maybe um, not only us as, as Westerners, as expats, um, but also inside um like the Afghan uh, government, um, I think there was maybe a lack of understanding of how deeply rooted those uh, those traditions and and that cons- uh, yeah conservatism was actually um, there. And yeah, I I do think um, yeah there was a lack of understanding of uh, how like Afghan society maybe was was set up. Maybe, um, Jim, I know we have a, a slideshow of some of your photographs, and maybe we could, if you wouldn't mind, just talk a little about sort of how you how you were t- trying to cover Afghanistan in the years you were there, what you were trying to capture, and 
how you saw your photography as a sort of tool for depicting Afghanistan beyond just the beyond just Kabul. So if, if I don't know if the organizers can put up the slideshow now. Um, yeah, I've always wanted to to show a variety of, of uh, angles and not just the headlines, not just the the fight and and uh, the politics, but also um, I mean stories about. Um, well, daily life. And I mean, Afghanistan is such a rich, uh, colorful uh, country, both in, in diversity and in, in, in culture. And I've always wanted to approach it in a way that, um, like I wanted to show all sides of it. Um, now, this in particular is um, the U.S. Embassy or the outer wall of the U.S. Embassy um, denied that, um, the Taliban took took um, control of Kabul, um, and yeah, it shows exactly that, um, like girls' education, everything that the West sort of tried to push, and the Taliban was uh, was clearly um, not very not very pro. Um, yeah, I think. Or bike ride. This was, uh, yeah, the night that um, the Taliban had entered the city and we had come home after seeing them um, enter and seeing them in the streets and, um, yeah, flocks of, of, of people um, basically come to, to cheer them on. Um, maybe not because of showing outright support, but people were confused and scared and maybe, like, being out there in support might have, might have um, helped settle them. Um, but yeah, then at night we were like, okay, what are we going to do? And um, yeah, we came to the um, idea of jumping on our bicycles and uh, see what the situation was um, in the city and around the green zone uh, particularly. Um, and we found this eerie scene of empty streets Um where Taliban had had taken the checkpoints, but there was very little activity um, at that time of the night. And yeah, going past the U.S. embassy um, was um, yeah a very very special sort of feeling. I think yeah. So this is um, in. May 2021, so uh, a couple of months before um, before the Taliban started uh, taking control of uh, provincial capitals, and um, I traveled down to Helmand with the Afghan military, um, province in the south, very volatile and sort of like always been uh, the center of um, of attention for the U.S. Um, U.S. military as well, and um, I was following sort of the fight to defend the last um, last bastion of um, of Afghan then government uh, control, and how sort of the outer edges of the city of Lashkargah were under heavy pressure. And at night, I, I went out with the military. Um, on sort of uh, resupply missions, and then on the way back, they um, made an unannounced stop at um, at a military base, and all of a sudden, all these soldiers um, are being brought on the helicopter. And it turns out that uh, they were evacuating uh, people, military on the periphery, to defend the center of the city. And yeah, the looks on on their faces; they're all very young um, infantry. And um, yeah, the looks on their faces just showed that, um, yeah, the end was near and everyone was tired. Um, this is um, by um, Lake Karga in, um, in Kabul, on the edge of Kabul. Um, so the, a couple of weeks after, after the Taliban takeover and where it was sort of clear that okay this was the new the new reality and the Taliban was going to amusement parks on Fridays to to have a day off and it was yeah really interesting to see how 
like the Taliban take a day off um, and come nightfall, um, dusk, um, the sound of prayer starts and everyone just dropped what they're doing and uh, put their weapons on the ground and uh, and started evening prayers. And this is how that sort of frame come together. <clears throat> This jumps back to before um, before the fall. Uh, this is in Kandahar, uh, the the largest city in the south of the country, um, a city where the Taliban had been um, doing a siege, really uh, encircling the city, and um, negotiations were going on in Doha. And the Taliban said, "We won't enter the cities." But then, in a few in a few places, that actually did happen, and um, so yeah, places with with open space just became um, impromptu refugee uh, camps, and the situation was very dire. Uh, there was no water, no um, or very little water and no sanitation and no electricity in the heat of day. And yeah, the situation was just really, really dire. This is uh, Kabul and here we can, we can, yeah, definitely, definitely see the growth that um, Kabul has has seen over the last two decades. Um, I obviously wasn't there in 2001, but I imagine it was uh, very different uh, compared to what it now looks like. It's a mega city of, uh, yeah, five, six million people uh, with, uh, with big apartment blocks and uh, wedding halls and just a real bustling, bustling city. Um, and yeah, it, I, it's my question: where is where is all of that going to going to go, and where will it end up um, in another twenty years' time? This was the first. Um, so, yeah, Matt and I um, we we were there. We had decided to um, to stay. Uh, stay put and and cover uh, August fifteenth when the Taliban entered entered Kabul. Uh, a lot of people at that point um, were were leaving. Uh, a lot of journalists were leaving as well, and uh, we had decided we need to to be here and be the eyes and and uh, witness um, this historic event uh, where after twenty years of U.S. involvement, the Taliban is rolling into into Kabul and it was um, afternoon and the sun had started to, to go down and we'd heard that the Taliban had entered from the west of, um, of the city and we had made our way out there and traffic has started to slow down, almost uh, come to a full stop and we continue um, partly on foot. And this is the first time we see a Taliban flag or I see a Taliban flag out in the open in Kabul. And I got the feeling then um, like, okay, this is it. This is actually happening. Uh, the event that um, I had not seen coming that fast um, is actually happening. And um, we're one of the few to actually uh, document it. Um, yeah, that was, I'll never forget it. Um, yeah, and then not too, not too long after that, on the first Friday, um, a couple of colleagues and I, we uh, head into town to um, photograph the first um, Friday prayers under the Taliban in Kabul. And we go to Polakhishti Mosque, which is a, a large mosque in, in the center of the city. Um, and yeah, the Taliban is there in, in full force and not the Taliban that you sort of have in, in, in your head looking um, like, well, traditional Afghan dress in uh, Kalashnikov and uh, those are Taliban fighters. No, they're, they're in full military gear 
uh, with night vision and, and the wraparound sunglasses. And it's just a very different sort of um, look to, to what you might expect. And, um, and yeah, we're there to, um, to photograph the Friday prayers and all of a sudden a uh, senior leader of the Haqqani network um, shows up and, and, and performs the sermon. And these were, were his bodyguards. So they were really sort of pushing the, the narrative of we are an, an organized army, an organized modern army. Um, and then we go to, um, yeah, to the very messy, very chaotic evacuations. Um, this is early morning. Um, and there was a few gates where um, the U.S. And, and its allied militias were in charge of, of the gates and letting people in still. And on other gates, there was um, Taliban in control already. And this is one of the gates where, where um, sort of the U.S. allied, CIA allied militias were still in charge. And just down the road were, were the Taliban. And so these two... Um, forces opposed to each other um, all of a sudden seemingly at agreement like okay we need to sort of let this happen um, and they could see each other and they've been fighting each other for, for years um, and then all of a sudden yeah there's, there's no more fighting and um, yeah that's an interesting interesting feeling to to see it at all envelop. Um, yeah, that's one of the one of the sort of more mind blowing um, m moments and, and experiences. Uh, this was um, an indoor garden of of General Dostum by then Marshal Dostum which is a, yeah, a longtime warlord allied to all sorts of um, different groups and factions over the years. Um, and he had built this incredible wealth and this is uh, his, his, um, his residence in Kabul. And this is, um, these are Taliban fighters um, that have taken, taken up that residence um, and sort of, those those guys uh, having spent twenty years outside of cities with very little um, luxuries and 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 sometimes resources, coming into Kabul and and seeing what um, what that looked like. This is an extreme example, but yeah, I think they were probably as as confused and astonished as uh, we might have been by by the sight of it. Um, yeah, a, a large part of the U.S. Um, sort of involvement in Afghanistan was um, building, road building, nation building. Um, and this is the road leading from Kabul to, to Kandahar in the south, um, a road that has taken immense efforts, um, both uh, financially and, and in human toll, to build, um, and it sort of became this cat and mouse game of, um, yeah, building the road and then Taliban blowing the road back up. And we hadn't been able, or I hadn't been able to travel very far on the road because of the risks and because of uh, the lack of sort of control and, and safety on it. And after the Taliban came, the road sort of um, were more accessible because violence had been subdued um and just yeah, being able to to drive and to see the yeah what had uh, happened there um where yeah after every 100 meters 150 meters you had a big uh, crater of a of an ied an explosive device blowing up um and and just the poverty around it you know um just to see how little of of the financial sort of commitment that was made had actually reached the people 
um, living right next to it. Thank you very much, Jim. That extraordinary photos and really a fascinating story. Um, Matthew, let me, if Jim brought up something in that picture of, of Kabul and, and how developed it is and what a big metropolis it is and, you know, the question of what now. Um, when, the, when the Taliban reached Kabul and finally took over, there were, there were a lot of theories. There were theories that they were going to, you know, return Afghanistan to what it was when they left. And there were theories that they'd spent enough time in hotel rooms in, in Doha and G5s at peace conferences that they, they understood the world and would modernize it, as we saw a picture of the, of the military. Um, what do you think? Where, where does it go? Well, first of all, what, I mean, at the beginning, it seemed one way, and now there's some indications perhaps that wasn't a, the direction it's going. But I'm curious what you th- where you think it's going. Well, I think I, I, given the shocking events of last summer and um, I, I think the deep misunderstanding about the Taliban that it revealed to us, or just how little we knew, I would be a bit unwise to uh, make predictions, but um, the the whole idea of a, whether the question of whether Taliban have changed or not, I find uh, a bit misleading. I mean, they they have changed in some ways, um, just as the country has changed, but their ideology and and they they'll, they'll be the first to tell you that their ideas haven't changed. You know, their vision of themselves hasn't changed, um, but of course that vision is implemented within a certain set of um, definite circumstances and environment, uh, the, the cobble that they've taken over is nothing like the cobble uh, of 2001, which was a half abandoned, half ruined city. You know, it's a vibrant metropolis. It's far more diverse. Um, the Taliban themselves are more diverse and they have uh, different trends within the movement. But I think, you know, what we're seeing now, happen around girls schools for example this this decision that was made to keep uh, high school girls from from class not, not allowing them to return um, which we expected to be reversed in in the spring and when it wasn't i think it was it was a a signal that the leadership is is unchanged and as many of the same people who were in power in the 90s um, their vision hasn't changed and we should also bear in mind that for the Taliban, I think their primary, the primary threat to, you know, to their rule is internal, not external. There's no real viable opposition um, at the moment. And most of the, I think all, almost all the regional countries and, and um, major players are not interested in funding another round of civil war. Uh, they'd like to see stability in Afghanistan and they're hoping the Taliban can deliver it. Um, so the main threat to the Taliban is their own in- internal cohesion um, and the risk of a schism. So they're prizing right now consensus and unity. And, and unfortunately, I think that often means that the more hardline elements uh, will prevail. So um, you, you just talked about how little we understood the Taliban before um, they came back into power and maybe still how little we understand them. Um, one of the things journalists often do is like we we celebrate the general who comes up with the surge <laughs> and we give him all this credit for transformation, not saying anybody in particular. Um, but do we have any idea who is the architect of the Taliban strategy that took the country back in the short order in which it, the Taliban took it back? Um, well, I don't think there is one uh personality who we could credit it to uh, there's there's some very important ones you know one of them is amir khan mutaki who's now the foreign minister and it, i think it's very interesting to see he was one of the main players in the doha negotiations with the u.s and then once the negotiations with the u.s were finished and it was supposed to be inter-afghan talks he was switched to become head of the well he was already head of the invitation and guidance committee um but he went, he returned to Afghanistan via Pakistan and popped up in Afghanistan, you know, sort of in the, in the months leading up to the collapse and was having these public meetings. And it was, he, his job was basically to persuade people to switch sides and surrender. And he was, the, you know, key element of that was this 
policy of general amnesty, the so-called AFWA. And I think that was really a very critical element in um, enabling, triggering this kind of domino effect collapse. When, when people began to believe that actually the Taliban wouldn't, weren't going to um, take revenge and kill them, that if they surrendered, their lives and property would be spared. And that we saw that happening uh, in the months leading up to the collapse, some, some very ugly massacres um, notwithstanding. But, you know, when Kandahar fell um, and Herat fell to the Taliban, there weren't like massacres in the streets. And that was personally, I think, you know, and I, I think Jim is on the same page here. That's, that's one of the reasons we decided to stay is because we saw how the Taliban strategy had shifted. And we, we understood that they were trying to become the government now and they weren't interested in, um, in killing foreign journalists for one. Uh, so I do think that we, in, in the, maybe in the, in the evacuation and, and the way that people um, felt such a dire necessity to leave, maybe re represented a misunderstanding of the Taliban that was based partially on the a propaganda of, of them being um, purely, uh, you know, mindless killers and terrorists. Yeah, I mean, uh, very interesting. Um, let me just, I, I see on the clock where we should be opening up the floor to uh, questions from the audience. I have one from email um, already. It says Afghanistan is a very fractured country, so it's likely the reactions to the collapse would vary. Um, did you find people who welcomed it? Uh, could you talk a little bit about sort of the mixed reactions of people when the Taliban came into Kabul? You want to ask that, Jim? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, um, yeah, whereas in Kabul itself, um, people were panicked. They were afraid not only by the Taliban itself, but how quickly they had they had come into um, come into town. Um, but yeah, I think many people were not necessarily happy that the Taliban were back, but more so that the fighting had stopped, at least for the time being. You know, people could um, sort of go about their lives um, again, even though, yeah, it's very different as before. There's a lot of um, of things to worry about. Uh, girls' education being one, um, women's liberties being another. Um, but yeah, I think um, there's, there's very divided opinions inside Afghanistan and outside too um, about what this means and, and where this goes ultimately um but yeah i think what i saw in the beginning was that there was a sense of uh, relief at least that um that people could go out into their fields and not being ri at risk of, of getting shot or or airstriked or um or that um but yeah i mean there's obviously um yeah there's division amongst all sorts of things in Afghanistan and the Taliban is just one of it. Do you both anticipate that the country will remain relatively under Taliban control? I know there are pockets of resistance, but is the Taliban organized bureaucratically to manage the country and to maintain security? I don't think their, their bureaucratic organization is um, particularly effective. I mean, they're relying on the existing uh, uh, government infrastructure, you know, all the mid-level and lower level civil servants, you know, most of them didn't get out in the evacuation. They need salaries to survive. They've gone back to work under Taliban officials. Um, but it's, you know, I, I think that Afghanistan is, there's it's always had a fairly weak central state um, that continues to be a case. It's more a question of whether there's going to be um, a, a challenge that, um, it, whether it's internal or, or external, um, usually it's the combination of both, right? whether, whether an out, outside power is going to fund a, a rival in another, another round of the civil war. Until that happens, I see in, in the near term, you know, the things being pretty stable. But again, it's, it's really hard to, to make predictions about this sort of thing because we know so little about the internal dynamics of the movement. Um, but as long as they stay cohesive, I, I don't see them um, being taken down by the challenger. 
and they don't unlike the, the obviously the, the Ghani government, you had contacts, as you said, within the government, people who for idealistic or other reasons were part of the government. You don't have those same kind of relationships um, that in the Taliban government, there's nobody you can talk to and sort of are, there, are, are foreign journalists able to get anything other than sort of carefully crafted or not crafted, but limited information from the Taliban? I, I mean, I just spent the last month talking to people in the Taliban government, and um, it's a, definitely a, a, a new and tense relationship. But you, it's there. It's there. You know, they're, they're people too, and you can build relationships with them, and people will begin to trust you a little bit, or at least tr- and trust your intentions. And um, I had a lot of very illuminating conversations off the record with uh, with Taliban officials. Yeah. Um, it takes time, it takes time and, and, and work. And I think we're just beginning to do that. And are you planning, just, I should have asked this a long time ago. Are you both planning to continue working there? Um, I definitely will continue working there. Um, whether it is full time or on and off is, um, is a question that that I haven't answered or been able to answer yet. Um, But it's also, I think, a question of will foreign journalists be, um, will will they keep on being allowed to work there? Um, Because, I mean, the Taliban have been um, welcoming to foreign journalists um, from the start. Um, That seems to sort of start have started to become a bit more of a um, difficult relationship. Um, but I think if anything, um, Matt and I, um, given that we, we sort of know our way around a little bit and there's definitely many others that do too. Um, I certainly hope that we will continue to, to work there. Um, and it's early days. I mean, the Taliban has been in charge for, um, yeah, about 10 months now. Um, and yeah, it's very early days to, to be, yeah, making predict, uh, predictions and, and, uh, look into the future and everything. Um, but yeah, I personally, I intend to, to, um, yeah, keep on going there at least and work there. Um, we both spent a lot of our, uh, career so far there and, I know I can speak for both of us. Like we love the country and and its people as well. Um, So yeah, that's definitely my intention. Question we got from on email, Jim, is did whether you ran into trouble ever with the Taliban since in an earlier iteration, they apparently didn't, didn't especially love um, individual photography and imagery. Um. For um, performing my work, doing my work, um, I haven't had any um, like problems um, in terms of yeah, photography is forbidden and that kind of stuff. Photography has always been um, a sort of difficult uh, thing to do in Afghanistan because of yeah. Uh, conservative values and and photographing women is is a very sensitive uh topic there as well um but i mean there was a lot of chaos there was a lot of um panic in especially in the beginning um like finding the right way to behave with um especially the younger um, sort of foot soldiers of the Taliban. Um, That was an interesting sort of learning stage, both for us and for them. Um, But yeah, I I don't really have um, many complaints about that because I know it's it's all new for everyone. Um, And it's sort of like, yeah, figuring out what works, what doesn't work. I think we should also point out this situation is completely different for Afghan reporters who've been intimidated, harassed, jailed by the Taliban. And there's, you know, been a really unacceptable double standard 
Um, unfortunately, we've seen, a, you know, just a, a lot of problems with freedom of the press for Afghans and Westerners have a very privileged position right now uh, in the country, which I think we should use to, to report. There's a question, Matthew, who came from email. Um, what was the immediate reaction toward the U.S. Uh, after the fall of Kabul? Uh, I guess the one question, one way of asking is, you know, was there a sense of betrayal? Um, you know, what do liberal what do liberal urban elites such as they were think about what the U.S., how the U.S. managed it? And what do you think the outlook is for how people in Afghanistan perceive the West and perceive the U.S. now? Uh, well, I think people in Afghanistan feel a great sense of betrayal and abandonment um, by the U.S. And, and still, but still hope are still dependent. I mean, the country is being kept uh, on life support by billions of dollars in humanitarian aid, which the U.S. is the largest donor to. So there's still this entanglement and dependency between the two countries. But I do think that people in the U.S., um, most of them would like to forget about Afghanistan, have forgotten about Afghanistan. Um, that probably includes the, the current administration, which has... Um, I think been happy to turn to, to, you know, conflict with Russia. Uh, and paradoxically, that's actually probably been for the best because there aren't a lot of good options right now in terms of um, U S foreign policy toward Afghanistan. And I think if there, there was more attention, there might be more pressure for revenge for sanctions. Um, the kind of thing that will just won't really have changed the Taliban's behavior, but will uh, lead to more suffering for the Afghan people. Hmm. Um, another question uh, from email. Do you see a generational difference within the Taliban, within Afghanistan in general? I mean, are there younger versus older divisions? Definitely. And I think that there are, are there's a whole generation of, of young Talibs who've um, Grown up in cities who are, who are educated, uh, some of them studied abroad. Um, but I don't know if, you know, there's also a lot of the, the you know, most of the suicide bombers were young too. So there is a, there is a generational difference in it, in, in, um, but it's not always, you know, going to be in a certain way, make, make mean that they're more liberal or open minded. There, there is a new generation of Taliban for sure. Can you talk just a little bit about that new generation of Taliban? Like, you know, what from you, the people you might be speaking to and who are those younger Taliban, how do they, how would you describe differences between what they, how they think and see the world and how their elders? I mean, they've, they've grown up in a world that is um, connected uh, yeah. and they have access to so much more information about what's happening, uh, just like the, the rest of their Afghan peers. And so, they are um, they're aware of, 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 of other countries and they're more literate. Um, they are, I think, more, more probably more tolerant of, of diversity. Um, just when you say diversity, what do you mean by diversity? Look, the Taliban of the 90s, they came from um, rural villages, mostly in, in southern Afghanistan, and a very specific, very conservative a culture. They didn't have access to television. They weren't literate. They, you know, most they had the radio. I'm talking, this is a generalization. Um, and that was, again, true for a lot of the country. But Afghanistan has changed so much in the last 20 years. They've, there's been this huge development that's obviously um, taken a big step back. But, it, but it's, it's also, I think, irreversible. And I, and I do think the Taliban have been affected by those those trends, they are part of the society, especially now that they've come back in and are, and are ruling it. And so if there is a reason for, for hope or just an expectation of some kind of project, pro progress and kind of change um, rather than a return to the grim situation in the 90s, it is in the fact that Afghanistan has, has changed, has, has become connected to the world. And the Taliban are aware of that. Um, but like the U.S., you know, it's a bunch of old guys who are making the decisions, which is, you know, we've been a lot of countries. So, yeah. so the, the mullahs in Kandahar are, 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 not, are not reflective of that, that change in diversity. But again, it's not just the Taliban that had that problem. Yeah, nobody, ha nobody has anything on the U.S. when it comes to gerontocracy. Um, one question from email. Um, 
about how you guys work together. Um, that too references Jim several times in his stories. Curious to know how you work together, how the reporting developed, how you shared material. So you could talk about your relationship a bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So as, as Matthew said um, a bit earlier, uh, we've known each other for a long time. Um, and then, yeah, sort of fate um, made um, for us to, yeah, be in the same uh, house when everything started crumbling um, quite rapidly. And I think for us both to be there gave us both a bit of reassurance that, okay, we can weather this sort of storm Um because we both know our way around and we um yeah we've it's not our first sort of rodeo in afghanistan um that definitely uh gave me the confidence to to stick it out um and then i mean we did a lot together we also went out on our own um but then it was yeah, sort of the the chain of events that um, that brought us. I mean, we did work for the for the New York Times paper together, and then it sort of we did this for the magazine also together. I think it's yeah very helpful to work as a team rather than than individuals in um, situations where there's many unknowns. Uh, yeah, like like Joe said there while we were working on the story, we were also basically um, covering the, for the New York Times, you know, as an institution, they, we were the only people they had on the ground. They'd evacuated everyone else. Uh, another friend of ours, Victor Blue, came on soon afterward. And so the three of us were the New York Times in Afghanistan doing the daily coverage, of course, with the support and, and you know, cooperation of their whole team and everyone, but they didn't have anyone else in the country. We, we also brought in, found some new local reporters to work with us. Um, so we had our own little bureau uh, and we we're extremely busy while all of this was going on. And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I think the story and, and, and that we, we came up with is a new reflection of those very unique circumstances. And I, I'm sure I would have stayed and I'm sure I would have done a story about it. Um, but it wouldn't have been the story if it wasn't for, um, the fact that I moved into Jim's, uh, for spare room, you know, a few months before the collapse having been away from Afghanistan for a few years and wanting to come back and write something. That's a great story. Um, and the story you, the package you wrote is, is a fantastic package. And I encourage everybody who's listening, who hasn't seen it to go on the New York times website, um, dig it out. The, it, it is a brilliant depiction of how the last days. And then the first days, the last days, of the old regime and the first days of the new regime took place in Afghanistan it's insightful. It's original, um, and the sort of the on the ground feel. The your your abilities as reporters who are able to really connect with local people is so visible and so important. Um, and I guess I encourage everybody to go and buy your books as well, since we're having that kind of promotional part of the of the conversation. But I want to thank you both for for spending an hour with us and congratulate you again for the prize and, and thank the Asian Society for hosting us tonight. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a real honor um, to be the recipients of um, of this award, and and yeah, to be with you today as well. Thank you. Look forward to meeting. Take care. <laughs>